Hello and welcome to a video which is all about what it's like studying computer science at university. Now I'm making this because that's what I did. I've got a computer science degree. I'm currently head of computing at a secondary school and I teach A level computer scientists every year, many of whom go on to study computer science or similar degrees at university. I'm hoping this will be useful if you are maybe just considering your options, maybe thinking about what subject you want to pick, maybe thinking about even if you want to go to university. And also hopefully it'll be helpful if you have decided you want to do computer science at university and just want to know a few more details and maybe some tips and tricks as well. The way I'm going to structure this video is the first half or so I'm going to keep as factual as I can about what typical things you might actually learn about in these degrees and how the degrees typically work. In the second half I'm going to be talking more personally about what I experienced and go into more of those bits of advice and so on. Just bear in mind as we're going through the bits and pieces are my opinion and of course every single person will have a slightly different experience at university. Let's start then by talking a little bit about what computer science is, just giving an idea if you're not too sure. Not everybody has done it of course in school. If you have a GCSE, if you have an A-level in it, you'll have quite a good idea but a lot of people will go in without much prior knowledge. So computer science is all about understanding computer systems and also algorithms. I think it's a really nice mix of theory and practice. So the practical stuff tends to come in the form of programming, which will be quite a big component in a computer science degree, but it won't be the only thing you learn. You might do a programming module every term at university, but there'll also be quite a lot of theory topics. So learning about how the computer works, learning about how the network works, and all of that knowledge which often gets applied in exams. Although saying that, even in some of the more theoretical topics like networking, there may still be chances to do more practical things like setting up the network, configuring it, stuff like that. What you are programming will vary. You might be programming a really simple, or you might call it an embedded system. You might be programming for a desktop app, a web app, a phone app. You might be programming a game. That will really vary based on the degree and what you're actually doing in that particular moment. A kind of third area which is sort of related to both is design. So designing systems and also designing these algorithms. So how can we make things as efficient as possible? How can we maximize the computers we have to perform at their best? This can be quite mathematical. Again, the level of maths will depend a little bit on the university and the modules, which we'll come on to a bit later. But a really nice mix of theory and practice. You'll leave with lots of knowledge and lots of skills as well. Before we go further, let me just say a little bit about myself because I'm going to be talking about a lot of my personal opinions, my personal experiences, and so you need to know what the context is. So I've got a degree from the University of Surrey, which is in the, well, I think it's fair to say the south of England. Uh, it looks very, very south on the map. It's fairly near London, about, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half away from central London. It was about sort of an hour away from where I lived in North London, which was quite a good distance for going backwards and forwards. My degree is computer science. The BSc at the start stands for Bachelor of Science. You can also get Bachelor of Arts computer science degrees actually and you also Bachelor of Engineering. I don't think the letters actually matter but there you go, it's a bachelor's degree. You also have master's degrees which come after you've got a bachelor's degree if you choose to do those. Now Surrey is a campus university. It's got one main campus with most of the buildings, most of the halls of residence on this one campus and it's in a town or a city actually called Guildford. It's a city because there's a cathedral right next door that used to wake me up every Sunday morning, unfortunately, because I lived very close to it for a while. Some universities will have several mini campuses. Some are spread out quite a lot, especially if they are in cities. It just depends. I personally wanted a campus university because I like to have all of it nearby, but you may not care or you might want something different. And fittingly, on this campus is a lovely statue of Alan Turing, who apparently lived briefly in Guildford. Uh, very famous computer scientist, one of the most influential ever in the short time the subject's been around, and he's got a nice statue near one of the lecture buildings. Now, as loyal as I am to the University of Surrey, I won't uh, talk too much about them, I won't promote them too much, because there are lots of good universities, of course, around the country, and if they are doing a computer science degree, their content should be fairly similar. There aren't huge areas to diverge, I would say, especially if they're accredited by the BCS. That should be a, f a fair indicator that what they're teaching is, is relevant. BCS is the professional body for computer science and similar areas in the UK. 
Variations might come in how practical the course is. Some are really examination based, some are mostly coursework. The amount of contact time you have, this is the amount of time you are sat in front of a lecturer in a theatre or in a meeting or an office hour. This can vary a little bit. Some universities are richer than others because of donations and things like that. And that'll be linked to the facilities. Ideally, you want a nice modern lab, nice lecture theatres. That's not always guaranteed, of course. The faculty in the department, people who are teaching the courses, people who are doing the research, that will influence, obviously, how high ranked the university is and also how good the teaching will be. It will be quite variable. Ideally, in school, you've got good teachers, people who are there to teach. But in a uni department, people who are there might be there for research and they just sort of get told to teach a module. They're not always the most passionate or engaging teachers necessarily, although they might be brilliant researchers, of course. And if that is the case, the reputation will be boosted. A lot of the rankings are based on things like the amount of papers produced every year or the percentage of people getting jobs or the amount of money spent per person on resources, etc, etc. And finally, the rigour of assessment might be a factor. You know, the top ranked university might have similar content on paper to the bottom ranked university, but in terms of how hard it is, you would suspect it's quite different. And employers will know that too. Before I go a bit deeper into what a computer science degree might look like specifically, let me just also acknowledge there are lots of sort of what I would call CS variant degrees, where they're loosely based on the same sort of content as computer science, but are often a little bit more specialised or a little bit overlapping with other subjects. So for example, um, IT and computing and management, these degrees or similar title degrees often might lose some of the maths in favour of some more business areas. You might be in certain lectures with people studying business or people studying management. So if your maths isn't strong, you might look to one of those slightly more businessy degrees. Software engineering and cybersecurity are two examples where you might have a more specialised computer science degree. Software engineering might also not have much maths. It might just be mostly programming, just in a lot more detail and a lot more time on programming. Likewise, cybersecurity might just be very little programming and mostly just on security techniques. Games development is a funny one because actually it can often be very very unlike computer science. You might have some programming to it, but a lot of it will be more the creative side of things. And so probably out of all of these here, games development is probably the least like computer science, although it might still have programming. You just need to check. Let me now go through what I think your course might well look like. So what specifically will you be studying and roughly when will you be studying it? Now this is of course loosely influenced by my own time, but I've looked at about sort of 10, 15 universities. Most of them publish their modules on the website. So you can look specifically at what exactly they're teaching, which is really useful. And so this is sort of an amalgamated list of what I've seen and what I've done myself. So the order here and the sequence can vary, of course, but the sort of high level topics you might be studying, maybe initially you start with some programming. You'll probably be doing programming in every semester. I should say a semester is really how most universities refer to the terms. So the first semester might be from, say, late September, early October till sort of late January. And then semester two might be from February up till sort of May, June. Often they have a very big Easter break, which is very nice, but different universities will approach this differently. Anyway, programming will often be in a language like Java. It's still quite popular, maybe Python, maybe C or C++ at this stage. Often it'll be object oriented, which not everyone has learned up until that point if they've done it before. Often there'll be some hardware studies, so just knowledge about how, how different hardware works and the different components work. You might be more practical if you're doing some programming to something like a, a Raspberry Pi, that's called assembly language. And you might learn a bit about how software works, things like the operating systems. Web development might just be HTML, CSS, maybe a little bit of JavaScript. It could be more about databases. It could be more about a framework like Rails or Flask, maybe. And there'll be, if it's a computer science degree, some maths in the first year. Things like proofs, so proof by induction, etc. Maybe some Boolean algebra and maybe some set theory early on in your first year. Maybe later on in the first year, you do a bit more maths. Often this will be not discrete maths. It will often be things like calculus. So if you've done A-level maths, this might be easier for you. I did do A-level maths and I still found it quite hard. So that might be a shock <laughs> if you get to that point, unless you are incredible at maths. Uh, I don't think people who are doing the kind of business version of my course did those maths modules because 
that just wasn't the specialism they were going down. There might be some stuff from the sort of more abstract design of algorithms or the structures involved. You might be doing some app development maybe. Android is quite popular still because it's open source and easy to do. And maybe a bit more about software design, exactly how people go about designing software products. That might just be a continuation really of your introduction to programming. Here are some possible year two modules. And maybe I should say a module is what I mean by one of these topic areas. So each one is taught by a different lecturer, usually only for one semester, if that's how it's structured. And they're done in parallel, right? You don't just do one, and then move on to the other one, move on to the next one. They're taught in parallel, like different subjects at sixth form, say. But you're going for a lot more. Each one will have different exams and different coursework tasks and will be a little bit different. So it does feel quite fresh. You're constantly getting new teachers, constantly getting new environments, really. Now, you might do more on algorithms, some more difficult problems, some more uh, maths, potentially, if you're analysing them. Database design could come up in year two, it could come up in year one, quite honestly. So how to structure databases, how to retrieve information. It could be more about data science, it could be more about using things like SQL. Networks can be quite knowledge heavy about all the protocols and ways things like the internet works, but it can also be you actually setting up networks depending on the approach. And there'll be some more programming inevitably. Maybe it'll be in a lower level language like C. Now C is still a high level language, it's still quite easy to use, but you've got a bit more control over things like the memory compared to something like Java or Python. And so it is quite good at understanding a bit more about what's going on under the hood, I suppose. In the second half of your first year, you might start to move towards slightly more applied areas where you're taking your programming and doing something else with it, such as programming to a parallel machine, like a graphics card. That requires some extra knowledge. Cybersecurity might come up. This might be quite operational and be about the security measures you've got to put in place. So how does antivirus work? How do firewalls work, etc. Or it could be quite maths based and be a lot about cryptography. It depends on the university. AI will usually come up at some point. This is maybe less exciting than maybe the name suggests. A lot of what you'll do initially is things like recognizing handwriting, recognizing faces, recognizing street signs, but using different algorithms and understanding how they work in a machine learning way. And the last one um, is can strike fear into lots of people. There will usually be a team project in the second year. This picture may or may not represent what that's going to be like. It may not be all harmony, I'm afraid. It's quite, for me at least, it was a bit of an eye-opener into what it must be like working as part of a development team. It can be quite tricky getting you know, this random person you've been put with to be on side. Usually you'll get put into teams, maybe of about six, and you'll be asked to create a project. We were making an app, which went quite badly, quite honestly. Um, but it was a really good experience, actually. Despite some long nights, it turned out fine. Just our app was was rubbish. I'll blame the developers. I wasn't really I wasn't really involved in that. The main reason we do that project in year two is, first of all, computer scientists are not always the best at working in teams, unfortunately. That stereotype does ring true to an extent. But also it's there to prepare you for what might be your third year. It might not be your third year. So many universities offer now a placement year, also called like a sandwich year sometimes. Now this could be in industry where you are working a full-time job effectively, or it could be where you study abroad. The university might have ties to another country and you go and actually just study computer science, presumably there. Um, I didn't do this, so I can't speak too much about either one of these approaches. You don't really do much uni work. You might just do a report or a presentation, but mostly you're just working in this job. Now my university was really keen on this. I think in the end maybe only about half of the year went. In my year we sort of had maybe roughly 150 people, maybe about half went. The application started quite early so we started talking about it fairly early in the second year which might be earlier than you might expect given it kind of happens in your third year potentially. So the applications are done by you right, it's not done through the university, at least it wasn't in my case. This means you have got to be ready for it, you have got to be prepared to go in ready for some interviews, ready for some applications, ready for some rejection potentially, and your first year results will be used. Now interestingly, well it was interesting to me because I didn't realise, the first year doesn't usually count towards your final degree classification. Usually only your second and third year count towards the grades you get at the end. But if you are about to apply to a, a well-known company that might be competitive, 
having good first year results will be useful. Now in terms of how effective this year is, I can't speak to that exactly. I know some people who went on to work for the companies they did for placement with um, a couple of years on. I know some people who went to very small companies and I question, I would question how effective that was. If it's a big company who's very used to getting people trained up, used to you know, shuffling people around, giving them a good experience, that might be effective. But if it's a tiny company where you're just literally working on a tiny project, that might not be a great use of your year. So it's worth thinking about, it's worth researching, worth getting some opinions from people who have done it before. I do think for people who did a placement coming back in the final year was a bit of a shock. I think some were so happy with their work, they just wanted to keep working and you've kind of got to come back and do another year. That's partly why I didn't want to do a placement year. I was very keen to get it, get the studying over and done with, I suppose. So this final year is the last thing you'll do as part of your bachelor's. And usually this is where options become available. So far I've shown four modules per semester, which is usually what the university does. But when you've got options, you might only pick say two options. And because you've got a final year project, that might take up two slots or one slot in terms of how many you're doing. So a final year project is this big thing you do all year, also called a dissertation, also called a thesis sometimes. You are researching a topic, you are making something potentially, they really do vary quite a lot, but in effect you produce a very long report, you'll do some code usually, and you'll get supervised. So you'll get assigned an academic in the department, you don't really get much choice in it, but they might assign you based on your rough interests, and they might give you a suggestion for what to do, they might not. Some supervisors were really on it and were really useful. Some, I think, were just just there to fill, fill, fill the numbers, basically. Mine was pretty good, was very active initially, and sort of faded off towards the end when I sort of was just cramming to get it done, but it was useful. Um, he gave me a topic to do. I didn't think of a great idea, so he gave me one, and it turned out to be quite a nice idea for a dissertation. Anyway, the options, I won't go through all of them because the list can be huge, it can be really varied. Some of these might be done as mandatory modules in previous years, depending on the university. Some of these might be across departments. So for example, uh, robotic systems might be done with some engineering departments. Uh, Internet of Things might be done with electrical engineering, for example. Because there are only so many academics, these more specialist areas might be shared across several related subjects. The final year was definitely my favourite, I think, because of the deep dive research you could do and because the lecturers tended to be a lot more engaged, the classes were smaller, the lecturers, in a couple of areas I had sort of genuinely world-class lecturers in these very narrow areas, which was a lot more valuable than kind of a first year lecture where the person's kind of stumbling through it and doesn't necessarily know too much about the thing they've been given to teach. Now, obviously, I've just given you some names in these slides of just potential module names. There will be 11, 12 weeks of content in there, of course, and some of the content you might recognise if you've done A-level before, some of it you might not. Clearly, there's so much, so many things which I haven't talked about. Like I said earlier, most universities do publish the content of their modules. They might save the different lecture titles or lecture content. So if you've got a university in mind, you might want to look at the modules. If you don't, just pick a university and see if you can find the modules Look at what they're doing in more detail if you want more information. Now to answer a question which maybe is premature, but I think it's important to have an idea of where you might go, which is what happens when you are done with your degree. Well, assuming your degree is a bachelor's degree, which is often three years, four years if you have a placement, you could stay for a fourth or fifth year and do a master's degree. So a master's degree is done after your bachelor's, you can't just jump to a master's. Usually these are only one year, if you do it full time, it is usually a full year, not nine months like a bachelor's year might be. Now you could leave your university and go to another one to do a master's, you could delay it a few years, you could stay at your university if you want to, and some degrees you might apply to when you are 17, 18 are called integrated masters and they are meant so that you do the masters at the same university as your bachelor's. I have not got a master's, so again I can't go into loads of detail, but they are a bit funny in some areas because some masters in computer science degrees you cannot apply for if you have a bachelor's in computer science. Many masters are there to help upskill people in related disciplines. For example, if a maths graduate quite enjoys programming, they might decide to do a master's in computer science to get up to speed with some of the computer science things. So it's often almost like a crash course 
for other subjects in computer science. There are some masters which are meant for people who have done computer science before, and in that case it's more of a just extension of your bachelor's, so go into more detail. There'll be another big project, another big dissertation for your masters. This one is a little bit bigger and lasts the entire year, and you're usually given a few months in the summer just to work solidly on this idea. So we're thinking about this if you want to you know, um, study in more detail, but they are a little bit quirky and require some more research down the line. Some people I knew did stay at my university and do a master's. I didn't really think about it because I was quite keen to get started and start applying for jobs. Now, having a master's will boost your chances in many cases, but you may not need a master's. So there are different categories of job you might get, I suppose. A graduate scheme, this is where a company has set up often a two-year program where they maybe have quite a gentle introduction to their line of work. So they're aiming only for people who've just finished a degree in something like computer science. These can still be quite competitive. I think some people finish quite arrogant thinking, oh, I'm going to get inundated with loads of offers from Google and Microsoft and Sony. But actually, despite there being a huge need for computer science graduates, you also have to kind of apply around, do lots of research, turn up for interviews and, and do well. The more ambitious you are, the more rejection you might get. And so that's something to, to think about. But you will get a graduate scheme if you've got a good CV and if you've worked hard and if you are a, a nice person, I think. You might need to kind of scour websites like LinkedIn, which I despise. But this is where a lot of companies operate, a lot of agencies operate. If you get desperate, you might look for an agency who can support you. Personally, having a LinkedIn account as a computer science graduate, you do get lots of people contacting you, inviting you to apply for certain jobs, which I'm sure in other subjects you might not get that. So we are definitely in demand, you'll be pleased to know. There are certain schemes which are much more like training as you work, so you might work towards a master's credit, you might work towards another qualification. That's effectively what I did. I did a two-year teaching program where I was teaching from day one in the classroom, but over the two years you gain, I think I gained sort of half of the masters in education by doing essays and things like that. Some people, a fairly small proportion I would say, move try and move towards academia, so becoming an academic at a university, becoming a lecturer, things like that. You can start PhD programs, for example. I was kind of loosely offered to do a PhD program. I, I didn't because I was quite bored. It was in the same area as my dissertation and I just was bored of it and didn't want to do six years potentially of further study, so I decided to start working. As part of your PhD program, you might be told to do a master's, you might in some rare cases skip that. Like I say, personally I was a little bit fatigued after my third year, I was quite keen to start working so that masters and PhDs weren't really in my mindset at that point. But having said that, now I'm a few years into my career, it's, it would be quite hard for me to leave my career and do a master's or do a PhD because after a few years working, your salary obviously goes up by quite a lot, you get quite settled, you might start to have a mortgage, for example, and so it becomes harder to go back. So if you have got an idea in your head you might want to do a master's or a PhD, I would suggest maybe not leaving it too long. Of course, there are sort of regular jobs, non-computer science jobs. The sort of jobs you might be getting, which are computer science jobs, are things like software developers, data scientists, analysts, but industries will value computer science degrees even if your job is not directly related to the field. And there are always people who do something else, people who go and volunteer for a while, some people just sort of lie around for a while because they're so tired, uh, some people go on gap years. Of course, what you do is really up to you. If you are interested in what sort of jobs are available, do some research. Indeed has lots of jobs on it. Some might be quite off-putting because of the salary being quite low or because the job description is quite ambitious maybe, but it's useful to get some context. You will get a job with a computer science degree. It's not a given, you have got to work for it despite it being an in-demand job. So don't get complacent, don't get too arrogant. In terms of salaries, it will vary based on loads of things of course. I would say most graduate schemes start at similar salaries. Unless you are leaving Oxford, Cambridge with a perfect degree. Probably your first job might be 25,000 a year, maybe 30,000 a year maybe, but there is quite a high ceiling with computer science jobs, so you definitely can progress. If you are, for example, a very good developer and you stay at a company for a while, or equally you move around quite a lot, your salary can definitely grow fairly fast and grow 
to be a big number. I don't want to give specifics because it will vary a lot. And, you know, the worst thing is people have in their minds they're going to be earning 200,000 a year straight away. Well, you might if you are an unbelievable developer many years into your career, but not straight away. Um, but you definitely can earn money with a computer science degree. Now, the last thing I want to talk about before I move on to some maybe more just personal experiences and what things are like on a day-to-day -day basis, is it worth it? Is a question you might be thinking if you are not quite sure if you even want to go to university. Well, a common thing I hear quite a lot is not wanting to get into loads of debt. Currently, it costs over £9,000 a year to study at a university in the UK as a UK citizen. As an international student, it can be a lot more money. It's really eye-watering how much money it can cost if you're coming from outside of the UK. Now, it is debt. I think I'm in about maybe £60,000 worth of debt to my university or really to the government, I suppose. It's not a debt which really bothers me. It's not one of those sort of like credit card debts which do affect your life quite a lot. What happens effectively when you get a job? Once you start paying a certain amount of money, it gets taken out of your salary in most cases. So this is a snippet of one of my pay slips from a few years ago. So my salary has thankfully gone up a little bit. But even back then, I was losing over £800 a month to tax of the first two, then a tiny bit of my student loan, and then a pension also takes that money as well. So I'm showing you this because, first of all, it's not a huge amount of money a month taken out initially. It grows a little bit more. Mine's over £100 now a month as my salary's gone up a little bit. But it's really like a tax. You know, It gets taken out, you don't really notice it. It stings a little bit maybe when you do look at your payslip but ultimately it's not a big deal. If you lose your job or you just can't afford it, you don't pay it still. You only pay it when you can afford it. Another point someone might raise at this stage is can't I just learn this stuff myself? And the answer is definitely yes. YouTube is great. You can buy textbooks which are expensive, but you can go to a library and get these textbooks out. I mentioned the universities publish their module details so you can kind of search around for what universities are teaching and use various resources to learn it yourself of course that's hard and would take a lot of dedication and a lot of resilience potentially because you haven't got people helping you as closely as you do at university all i would say is the lack of rigor from doing it yourself there's no accountability necessarily you're not doing tests you're not doing coursework you might not really have much practice to do it will limit how much you're learning and of course doesn't prove to an employer that you can do it they want to know that you've got the skills you say you do. Having a degree does demonstrate that, whether you agree or not. Another valid question is why not just do an apprenticeship? Absolutely, do an apprenticeship if you want to. The quality is not amazing. You know, the government have got a search function where you can search for apprenticeships. If you search for computer science like I did, there are apprenticeships. A lot of them, looking through the list, are not actually computer science jobs, but some will be. You have got a hunt for it, I think. My younger brother is now working in tech, working in the sort of job where computer scientists go into. He didn't go to university, he got an apprenticeship. It took him quite a lot of work. He didn't get one straight away. He had to do a kind of mini apprenticeship before doing the main apprenticeship. So it can be more work, but definitely research it if you're not sure that university is quite for you. Another question might be, do employers actually require, do they actually need a computer science degree? They might want it, but do they need it? No, not everyone will. For example, looking on Indeed, the first sort of junior developer job I saw was this one. It says it prefers a bachelor's degree, so that means it doesn't require it. But if you notice, you know, the salary range is quite a big range. If you walked in with no degree, despite knowing C Sharp, which I think was what this company used, you can imagine they're going to place you towards the bottom of that range. Whereas someone who's got a good degree who also knows C Sharp, you would think might get placed towards the top of that range. So you might be disadvantaged by not having a degree, but certain companies won't care as much if you've got evidence that you know what you're talking about. There are some industries where you need to have a degree. So for example, teaching is the one which is obvious to me, but often public sector jobs need a degree. So it's worth doing some research, but it will boost your chances, I think. Having said that, a bit like how GCSE is no longer that important once you get to A-levels, once you've had a few different jobs, your degree is not nearly as important. Your previous experience is important. So once you get your foot in the door, you might be able to move up the ladder regardless of having a degree. And a final point, maybe questioning how worthwhile it is. 
Let's say you've got an A-level computer science already or you're about to get one. Is there more to learn? Is it worth it? Is it not worth getting another degree in a different subject to kind of boost your overall knowledge? Maybe. You want to stick to what you're interested in. It's important you are interested in this. If you've done the A-level computer science and you loved it, why not do it for another three years? You'll definitely learn more. If you picked a random subject that you think might boost your knowledge, you might not like it. So you've got to stick to what you like at this current moment. You'll definitely learn a lot more. There'll definitely be things you find hard. I went in with a GCSE in computer science, not on A-level. I knew programming quite well in Python. When I started Java, I was definitely hit for six a little bit. I was very shocked by how hard it was initially. I had to work really hard. I mentioned earlier that I had an A-level in maths and I found some of maths quite hard, at least initially. It does get easier over time, but there are new things to learn. You don't want to be too closed off to the idea of learning more things. Right, so for this second part of the video, I want to talk a little bit about what university is really like. Now, not all of this will apply specifically to computer science. Some of this stuff is just my general experiences. But I want to talk about a few things which I wish I had known when I was applying, when I was planning to go, and even in my first few weeks and months at university. Um, I was a little bit naive. I didn't really know much about it. I didn't really even try and find out much. But hopefully these things will be useful and will be maybe interesting or give you some more perspective. And of course, this is just based on my experience. Your experience might be different. You might speak to somebody else who has a different experience. It's all different for everybody to an extent. So starting with accommodation, because I think this is such a big factor and such a big thing because it's where you live, of course. So my experience at university was pretty typical. I started in halls of residence, then I moved into private rented house shares in my later years. So halls of residence are these purpose-built buildings usually owned by the university, often on campus or very near it. This is my actual room in my first year of university. One of the only pictures I have of it, so evidently I was very proud when I took this picture, despite my bed obviously not being made and some empty bottles and so on. Pretty basic, these rooms. You're given usually a single bed, chair, desk, shelves, wardrobe, um, and not a lot else. Now, these flats might house between maybe six and 12 people. Mine was 11 people, I believe. You have these rooms, usually you've got one kitchen between all, say, 11 of you, and maybe a couple of toilets, a couple of showers, and that's it. I was lucky, I had a sink in my room, which was pretty useful, but not all of them well. And there are often different bands. You might pay more to have your own little kitchenette or an ensuite. You might pay less to not have a sink or to have someone sharing this room with you. It's really your choice. You can see from this picture, like a good computer scientist, I've taken a lot of my stuff with me. I've got a very massive bulky computer under the desk. I somehow managed to fit in a car to take to university. Uh, this picture bottom right, I think I was watching this with someone. I hope I was at least, but all of these tech things. I don't necessarily think you need all of this. I'd recommend having a computer if you can, ideally a laptop if you can. I'll talk more later about what you should look for. If it feels like a kind of a comfort to take all of your things, by all means do, but they're usually fairly small rooms, so just bear that in mind. Now, you are not forced into joining a halls of residence. And usually the joining happens sort of after results day, when your offer is finalized. It's usually quite a quick process, I found. You're not forced to though, it's up to you. And so the kind of pros are relatively cheap. The university, if it owns it, is usually not trying to rip you off, at least not through uh, your accommodation. My flat, my room in my flat was, I think about 120 pounds a week. And it seems like those prices have been fairly stable in the years since I left. And actually, you know, any other rental price has gone up by quite a lot. Prices will vary based on the quality of your room, but also where you are in the country. A key pro is it's very easy to meet people. You have to meet these people, right? You turn up on the moving in day and you're faced with, say, 11 new faces and you have to get to know each other. You're gonna be seeing each other most days. You know, there are some people you seem to bump into all the time in your flat and become quite close to. There are some people who you might see, you know, once a fortnight and they just sort of pop out to make some coffee or something. But you get to know people. In my flat, I had someone who was doing my course. I'm not sure if that was a deliberate move or not. Sometimes universities try and allocate you based on your interests or things like that. Another key benefit, which is why first years tend to get these is Close by, I was five minutes from all the lecture theatres, and so that was so, so easy. The final one is the price, usually includes the bills. 
paying bills is a chore and obviously it's for that extra money. But for cons are, shared areas. I am not someone who particularly likes sharing my space with other people. I like my own space, which I can have, which you don't have when you are at university in a halls of residence. You have your room, of course, but ultimately you're sharing a kitchen, toilets, showers. You have to let a lot of stuff go, I think, and try and be as easy going as possible. It's not a nightmare. Usually these are cleaned and people are decent most of the time, but you've got to be maybe patient and like I say, let some stuff go. And because you've got loads of young adults in one building, especially on Friday, Saturday nights, it can be loud. People will be partying. There's quite a big party culture in, I think, every UK university, which you might love, you might not like at all. You might not have even really experienced that yet. It's not unbearable, of course, but again, in terms of letting stuff go, if you're bothered by any sound, you really like to be quiet and go to bed early, wake up early, you might wanna think of a different option. But it's not a huge deal. Get some noise cancelling headphones, put up with it for an hour or two every Friday night and it'll be fine. The flats are pretty basic. There will not be, I suspect, a dishwasher or a washing machine or a dryer nearby. There will often be a laundrette nearby, maybe just a community one or a university one. That's obviously a bit of a chore, having to drag your washing somewhere else. So the home comforts you might well not have in these halls. And finally, it's a maybe not a con necessarily, but these are only often available in that first year. And so you've got to move. You can't get too settled, although you might want to move by the time you get to the end. Right, so some more pictures. This is, first of all, me looking very young and looking very done with things. This is me, I think, three in the morning in our shared kitchen. Uh, you can see the very cheap kettle behind and you kind of get a cupboard each usually in a kind of a shelf in the freezer and fridge each. Uh, so yeah, this is me, I think after quite a late night, or after quite maybe a heavy night, depending on what was in that drink, I can't quite recall. But yeah, um, this is the other side of the kitchen, you know, fairly simple, loads of stuff lying about. Not wonderful if you are very, very clean and tidy. This was, if I hide this, this was the other side of my room, so you can see the sink and the cupboard. This was after I moved out. Hence, there being no stuff. So, halls of residence, good experience for eight months. I wouldn't necessarily want to do it anymore, but I think it's quite a common and nice part of university life. Uh, this was the shower as well. Pretty basic, not particularly lovely, I've got to say. But all fine, all fine. And here are some pictures of a slightly nicer halls of residence I stayed at when I was doing my teacher training. This was at UCL in central London, and so nicer views out of the windows but this was about sort of 15 minutes away from campus or away from the buildings I was at at least. And so city universities are obviously a little bit different, although this one was nicer and would have been a lot more expensive because I had a built-in ensuite. The second key type of accommodation, which I used in my second and third years at university, which is what a lot of people will do, are house or flat shares, where you're not doing it in university accommodation, or you're doing it privately. Here are the two houses I stayed at. We're not palaces, we're not awful. It was quite nice, at least initially, to get out of the halls of residence and be a bit more independent. It was the first time sort of living on my own, in a home on my own, although I was sharing, of course. Um, so these tend to get organised fairly early, actually. It kind of shocked me how early it was. People started talking about this. I had people going for viewings in December of my first year, so only a few months into it. I think I had mine finalised maybe March of the first year, so that was a little bit later. It can feel quite daunting if you feel like you're going to miss out on a house or you feel like you haven't got a group to buddy up with. I really wouldn't worry too much. There are always going to be rooms available. There is always private accommodation in these university towns in particular. But in your first semester, I would start to sort of suss out who you might want to stay with, who you might want to share a house with. I shared with three other people in each time, which was, I think, a good number. I wouldn't want to share with any more or any less, quite frankly. But that's something you need to think about. In your first few months although it shouldn't dominate your life because it's not as big of a deal as it maybe you can seem in terms of just a property the pros are compared to halls of residence you've got more control it's your home you can move furniture in we bought a tv in one of them like it's a bit nicer than a, a very basic shared area depending on your housemates you might be more separate from uni you might be more out of that bubble so if you are not keen on partying if you buddy up with people who are also in that mold you might not really feel like you're anything to do with that culture. You don't choose your flatmates in your halls of residence, but you kind of do in your in your house shares. 
Uh, these may, depending on the quality, have the appliances you might expect and decent bathrooms and double beds. Mine were a little bit variable. You know, I had a double bed in both, but the appliances were, you know, not great, but better than nothing. Cons are, these are usually private, more expensive. Mine was, I think about, I think the first one at the bottom, which was quite far from university, was about £600 a month. I'm sure that shot up quite a lot now, quite frankly. The top one was about, I think, 800 It was only 10 minutes away. And I cannot tell you the difference between living 10 minutes away and living, you know, say, half an hour away. In terms of your motivation to do stuff, it's very tempting to skip a lecture if it's going to take you longer to get there than go to it. Because you've got landlords, fees can be tricky. You know, mine were fine, to be fair, but they're going to be in to check, do inspections. You're going to have people come and visit when the next kind of year rolls on and they try and get the next tenants in. So that takes more kind of management, I suppose. And because there is sometimes a rush and it's not done for you, it can be hard to arrange. It can be hard to find good housemates. People can be a bit flaky. You might have someone drop out of your group and suddenly you've got to find somebody. Those sort of things are something you've got to kind of manage. But if that sounds daunting, honestly, it will work out. It's, it'll be fine. The last one is that distance. Like I say, it makes a big difference if you can be close, but they tend to be, because they're normal houses, a fair distance away. Right, more pictures, because maybe that's the interesting bit. Uh, on the left is just my desk in one of these. You can see I got a laptop fairly quickly. As a computer science student, if you can get a graphics card in a laptop, I would say that is the perfect combination. I didn't really take the laptop to lectures, but I did take it to labs sometimes. Instead of using a lab computer, I would use my laptop because I had my files, I could work on it at home. If it's a fairly you know cheap laptop, it may not be up for it. And without a graphics card, you can't do certain programming things. So if you can afford it, I would go for that. It's better than a desktop computer, unless you are really into your gaming or the budget doesn't allow for that. On the left is me revising for a final year exam very early in the morning, I think, maybe even the day of the exam on memes. Uh, <laughs> it was a kind of genetic algorithm exam, this one. On the right is a, a picture of my kitchen. You can see I've got a washing machine. It's flooded, I think, several times in the year, which wasn't great because they're not exactly the most expensive ones usually. But this was nicer, easier to cook in, more private, obviously, than a halls of residence kitchen, but pretty small. You'd have to kind of manage that between the people living there to make sure you're not in each other's way. Here's a picture of a living room we had on the left. Didn't really ever use it. It was only really for washing, uh, for drying our clothes, sorry. And on the right is, I think, moving out day in one of my houses. You can see the chair is completely knackered by this point and all the stuff I dragged, most of it not very necessary. So do try and cut down, but not to the point you're going to be uncomfortable. Now, the third kind of type of accommodation only applies to some people, which is living at home. You might not live anywhere near university, but some people I knew sort of lived maybe an hour away and commuted in. So they took the train in the morning, took the train home at night or drove, whatever they did, and we kind of approached it almost like a job. Now you might live five minutes away from university and, and so this doesn't all apply, but most people I knew who lived at home lived a little bit away. I guess the main benefits are more comfortable. I've put a question mark because of course you may not be that comfortable uh, living at home when you're at university. It depends on your family and your room and your living space, I suppose. Because you've got that separation, especially if you are literally going in the morning, coming home in the evening, you can kind of separate your normal life and your uni work potentially, or not, as the case may be. And if your parents or family are kind, you may not really have to pay much or any rent. But the cons are, you know, hard to meet people if you're not very sociable anyway, potentially. The travel time and the cost of it could be, could kind of cancel out that rent, maybe not fully, but at least to a, a certain extent. And the main thing I noticed with people who were commuting, I would kind of guiltily go back to my room when I had, say, a two hour gap between lectures, but other people would have to sit in the library or sit or kind of wander around or those sort of things. You might really enjoy that. You might want to go to a coffee shop or go into town or meet people. But personally, I like being able to go back to my room quickly when I had gaps in my timetable. Now, I guess the main one, and it really depends on what you're looking to get out of university, is no, maybe not having that quote unquote university experience where you are on your own maybe for the first time, no parents potentially around to keep an eye on you. That is tough at times, but is a really good experience overall, and you may not really have that living at home. And the last one, if you do live far away, it makes it more and more likely and more and more tempting that you're going to want to skip certain events 
because just you can't be bothered or it's not worth it. Another area which you need to sort of hear from someone who's actually done this is about how busy you might be at university and I would say it's quite similar to sixth form. Your timetable is going to have gaps in it but there are going to be some busy bits as well. Now there are I guess four main timetabled things CS degrees will have. I mean this might vary a little bit based on your university. I know some go really heavily on tutorials and things like that. Lectures where you're sat in a big room with lots of people, the teacher or the lecturer is just talking at you mostly. Seminars or tutorials are usually smaller groups. A seminar might be say 30 people in a room. A tutorial might be say five people in a room, it's usually a little bit smaller. And they're meant for more one-on-one -on -one support. You might be solving things while you're doing it. Although a lab is where you solve most of the things. A lab is where you go to usually a computer room and do some tasks, they give you some activities and I'll show this in a few minutes time. And office hours are sort of optional drop-ins where you can go and see the lecturer if you want to. Uh, I can't say I used that very often, I might have used it once in three years, which is not great. Uh, I'd recommend you try and make use of these people, seeing as they are experts in their field. Right, so this is my timetable in my first year, which I'll show bigger in a second, um, so I won't talk about that just now, apart from the fact that I had a nightmare four to six lecture on a Friday afternoon, which, or a Friday evening, I could argue, which was a killer. Here's a picture I took of a friend of mine. I don't know if he was literally asleep, but he was going that way. It was it was rough, I've got to say. Um, yeah, tough. Uh, the kind of one interaction we had occasionally were these sort of voting systems. There might be similar systems at your university. Not every lecturer used it. It was a lot of just them talking at you for two hours, essentially, which were occasionally very, very boring, I've got to be honest. I made the mistake of always going right near the back which is my instinct, as far away as possible, which was, very, which made it very easy to check your phone, to play around on your laptop if you took it. And also, you can't hear anything. So I'd really suggest you do not sit, maybe not front row, unless you're very keen, but try and sit fairly close for your own concentration and also so you can hear what's going on. Now obviously the timetabled events are not the only thing you're doing, you're working outside of it. And I would say it's definitely not a nine to five job unless you are extremely self-disciplined, it certainly wasn't for me. I was working evenings, weekends, towards the exam time, towards the coursework deadlines. I was work, you know, you'd wake up early and do the coursework, you would stay up very late. You know, it's not, you're not limited to just the time your timetable, of course, right? You are investing in yourself, I suppose, and so the more time you spend on this, the better. Although many people do have part-time jobs, I did some tutoring, that was sort of the extent of my work at university, beyond studying. So you need to think about what is best for you. Just on this timetable, a tiny bit bigger, and on the right is an example of a lab, I think a third year lab I did. So some of the labs were quite useful, some were not. I definitely didn't go to some of them. Um, the timetable is quite awkward, and hopefully you can see why I was talking about if you live at home or live a long, long way away, there are gonna be gaps which might be good, depending on what you like to do, but also might be quite difficult. Now, there will be lots of free time. For example, in my first year, I had Wednesday off, which was great. Because of the semesters, this timetable is not constant, right? It's not a, a, a timetable for an entire year. It's for, say, 11, 12 weeks, which is a blessing, I suppose. But I do remember Friday being being a tough day in my first year, uh, for sure. So this lab on the right was not, a, I think, maybe a great example of a lab. Here are some other examples I managed to get off my computer. So they give you some tasks, usually in the lab where I was, there'd be the lecturers kind of walking around helping, you might not see them if it's really busy. Usually there'd be some sort of students from the year above or some research students helping out as well, which was occasionally useful. It really depends, like many things, on the quality of the lab work. Some tasks were just impossible, some tasks were too easy, some tasks you could just do at home and so it was easy to skip them. I would recommend using all the time you have and really trying. And if it is too hard or is it, if it is too confusing, you do ask for help because that definitely wasn't my strength, I would say. Here's a picture, I, I don't remember taking this picture, but a picture of one of my lectures. Uh, the smiling faces don't necessarily reflect what the faces were looking like, but I didn't want to show any faces. So you can see uh, this was, you might recognize some of this stuff if you've done GCSE array level. We've got some truth tables then some more kind of advanced logic on the right hand side. Some lecturers are more old school and would do it on a whiteboard, not many actually. 
This is a chalkboard actually. Most are just slides like a PowerPoint. They just go through and they talk at you. Some lectures, some lectures I should say, in the first year in particular are packed. My cohort was about, I think about 200 initially. It quickly reduced down to maybe about 150 and it kind of thins out as the time goes on. I don't really know where some of these people go. They might change courses, they might drop out. They're not the ones you tend to see very often because some people don't turn up at all. They might even not really be around very, mu very much. They might not even really be in the country even. But it's definitely hard getting a seat early on. Uh, I'd recommend you chat to people around you, although that can be obviously a bit awkward. Here are some examples of some of the lecture slides I've managed to find. So again, the quality varies quite a bit. Some lecture slides were perfect because you could really just revise from them and just understand them based on the lecture itself. Some you needed to be in the room to understand. Some even if you were in the room and had the slide, you still couldn't really understand because they were so confusing. It varied quite a lot. Now at my university, some lecturers recorded their lectures, which was quite good, although still it can be hard to follow, right? If someone's starting to write on a chalkboard, you can't watch that later. I found if they were recorded, my chance of going to it was massively reduced, which again is not great, but that's the truth. Some people would sit in lectures and diligently copy down notes. I wouldn't do that too much. I would generally only write down things which weren't on the slides, and so therefore I couldn't revise them later. Although if the slide was confusing, you want to take some notes if the person is explaining it. You probably can't see, but this slide deck was 100 pages long for a two hour lecture. So very hard to revise from later on. Despite some lectures not being amazing, generally they're okay and you learn and that's what you're there for. Ultimately you are paying nine grand a year effectively for this. So you should make use of it. So once you've done the learning, what are the assessments like? Well, you know, there are two types of assessment, much like school, so exams and coursework. The percentage varies quite a lot. I actually have put on my slide that exams, for me at least, were about sort of maybe 40% of the overall amount of work you were doing and coursework was maybe about 60%. Although I saw certain universities which have are very exam heavy or very coursework heavy. So it does vary a little bit. This is where maybe the differences also start to come in. So the exams are usually paper-based in quite a big hall, like you would expect. They're often written by the lecturer. Some are just last year's paper tweaked a little bit. Some are brand new every year and are really difficult. It's not nearly as standardized as a-level exams are, or GCSE exams are, for example, where you've got one exam board which is consistent. It is quite variable, so it's worth it's worth thinking about in case you do badly or in case you do really well. Some are on-screen programming, or just like multiple choice on a computer. I'll show some examples of this a bit later, and usually done right at the end of the semester, and you might have, say, three or four exams per semester. Now for me at least, because there were a fair few exams and because coursework was so important, it did mean, despite there being a fair few exams, they were not nearly as stressful as, say, your GCSEs or your A-levels would have been. Now if you are just approaching the end of your A-levels, for example, you might not be too pleased to hear that there are more exams to come and quite a lot of exams, but these are not nearly as stressful as A-levels might be. Hopefully your A-levels aren't stressful if you are about to do them, but they're obviously quite high stakes university exams in part because of the amount of coursework and not quite on the same level, um, I would say. So in terms of the different coursework tasks you might do, some are just reports, such as you investigating something, writing a few pages on it potentially. Some are answering questions, maths modules, for example. Some are actually developing something, making something like a program or an app or a website or something along those lines. You've, you've got a few which are thankfully more rare, which are a little bit weirder. So ones I had to do are make a poster, I'll show you that a bit later. Present in a Viva, which is where you just sort of speak at your lecturer and they ask you some questions. A bit like a presentation really, but a presentation is where you maybe have some slides to back you up. Not something to worry too much, even if that's not something which you're too comfortable with. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you do a dissertation in your final year, which is really the mother of all coursework, a massive report where you make something. Now, the amount of coursework can vary a lot per university and per module. You might have one or two per module, depending on what they are. Hopefully the university will try and separate it out like mine did, so they're not all due at one point. Now just on grading, because I know that's important and not something you maybe know much about before you go in, here are excerpts from my kind of final transcript. The top is, you can see the level four is year one, level six is the final year. 
The main column to look at at the top is this aggregated score. So this was the average percentage from my year. Now, most universities rely on this grading system, where if you get more than 70%, you get a first, and usually only year two and three, or the um, level five and level six are counted, so they're sort of averaged in some way. I'm not quite sure if it's a straight average or if there's some weighting. So first is more than 70%, then you've got upper second, two, one, lower second, two, two, and a third, and then you might get a pass or you might not. I don't know exactly how different universities approach that. So you can see, that was my sort of year averages, which were fine. My first year didn't count, and so me spending all that time to get a first in my first year was a bit pointless, but it was important in my second and final year. The reason why my final year grade was so high was not because I aced everything, it was because my dissertation was good, and so that massively brought up my grade. The dissertation counts for a lot in almost every degree. So you can see this is my second year at the bottom, the breakdown of my individual grades from each unit and as you can see the weighting varies a fair bit based on the module but also my mark varied a fair bit which I'm less uh, which I'm not obviously massively proud of some were very much tick box you do the questions you get 100% or near it some were a lot a lot harder for example I did really badly in one of my coursework at the bottom 35% did really badly in one of the exams, 36%. Unfortunately, ironically, the content of that exam I now do teach at A level a little bit. I don't tell my students that. But it does show that actually, because there is so, there's so much assessment, there are so many chances to do your best. If you don't do well in certain things, you can usually make it up. And it's all about the average overall, not individual modules. But I also think it shows how variable the rigor and how difficult the different things are. Maybe other universities are, are more consistent, but the one I was at had lots of strengths, but definitely some things were really easy, some things were really hard. Me doing really badly at these two modules was obviously partly my fault, but it was also, it was clearly a very difficult exam, very difficult coursework, because, yeah. So, not always consistent, but as long as it is overall good, you'll be fine. Just to now show some more pictures of things I did, so, Bottom is one of the weirder courseworks I did. I did an education module, and part of my coursework, I suppose, was going to a school once a week and helping out, doing bits of teaching. Not very well, I think, in hindsight, essentially. On the right here is one of the more typical bits of coursework, a report. The questions for it are on the left, or at least part of it is on the left. So, more typical questions. You use the labs to help you. You answer them, you get the marks. Here are some more examples of work I did. On the left, we've got two different maths courseworks. One on the left, I don't know if these were my final answers or not. I don't know if these are right or not. The bottom one, the lecturer made us type it in in SymPy, which is a variant of Python, so he could auto-mark it. Unfortunately, I don't think it really worked when he auto-marked it, but some tricky questions for sure. The top was a poster, so it was a really weird bit of coursework. I mean, I picked quite a weird topic to explore, but loads of work written on one PowerPoint slide. It was a bit strange to get loads of marks for actually not much stuff on this poster. And at the bottom is part of a presentation I had to do. It was from the education module that I did. And the big dissertation in my final year was a really, really valuable experience. It's not too dissimilar to the NEAs. People who do A-level computer science might have done or be doing, obviously on a slightly bigger scale, but the end result might be roughly the same amount of pages. Mine was 86, so not it's not hundreds of pages in most cases. I did sort of a, a mix of research slash making a bit of software. Doesn't look very impressive, but it was mostly for research into what was going on behind the scenes, which got me marks. The top picture is a lesson for everybody. I did the dissertation. I did work on it throughout the year, but I did most of the work in the last few days. I cannot stress how stressful that was. Here are some pictures I've think of all three of them are from the last few days of the dissertation. One of the left is me working in the labs early in the morning and you've got kind of a empty red wine glass, coffee, cheap burger from Tesco's, Monster Energy, GitHub, all of the things you might expect from a computer science student. This picture was me uploading my dissertation about 10 minutes before the deadline and it wouldn't work. Somehow I got it to upload about two minutes before the deadline which almost made me keel over but I got over the line eventually it was a stressful last few days definitely if you can
do the work early and put in the time and be organized, it makes such a huge difference. Unfortunately, it was not my strength, but you learn from it. Now, one of the last things to show maybe are some examples of exam papers. These weren't exams I actually did. These were all from modules I did, but the exam papers I have on my computer are just past papers, I guess, from years previously. Here are some examples of some of the maths questions you might get. I, I haven't picked these for any particular reason. Some might look quite nasty and some are quite nasty, I think. You might recognize bits from A-level maths or from computer science, but yeah, it's fairly standard exam papers. Difficulty can vary a fair bit. Sometimes, like I said earlier, the exam papers are very similar year on year, and so you can almost predict it. Sometimes they're not. It can vary a little bit. They're also just for sort of standard theory exams. I think there's probably question on the, questions on the left. A fair few of you might be able to answer if you're doing A-level. The other ones, maybe not. But just you learn the lecture slides, you revise, and they're not too bad usually. The programming ones can be a little bit difficult, obviously, to assess. Some are on paper, some weren't for me. So the kind of left-hand side and top here are examples of doing things on paper. It's just multiple choice, and then having to actually awkwardly write C++ code on paper. That was quite tricky. Um, the bottom right image is of a class diagram, which you can't see really, and some questions, which was an on-screen exam. They give you some skeleton code, get questions, you add to it. That was how many on-screen programming exams work. And if you've done AQA A-level or are doing it, you'll know that's how one of their papers work as it stands. Most programming is assessed through coursework in the main, but you might have to do some either on-screen or paper-based exams too. I finally want to end with just some tips because some of you watching might be getting ready to go maybe a few weeks or a few days before possibly. What would I suggest you do if you can? Well, make a list of what you'll need as early as you can and aim to take as little as possible. Doing this early means that if you forget stuff, you can go back and add it to the list. If you do it the day before, you might not write down everything you need. And think about what you need to take. Does your car, is your car necessary to take? Is your massive chunky PC necessary if you've got a laptop? Do you need the Xbox, pairs of shoes, etc.? The answer might be yes to those questions, which is fine, but just think about it because space will be at premium. It's also nice if you go home to visit every couple of weeks or every month, say, to have stuff at home. You know, I went home sometimes and my room was empty because I took all of it to university. You want to have some stuff at home still for when you visit. If you can, try and join some group chats before you start. Now, when I did it, this was on Facebook. I don't know if that's the case now, quite possibly not. I don't know where it would be otherwise, I'm afraid. But if you can get in a group chat with your halls building to know some people before you move in and ideally have a course, you'll get some insider information. You might meet people you might hear about news before the rest of your course. As you can imagine, the course group chat was usually most active when you were in a very boring lecture. Now, some people are better than others. I was useless at the life skills area of moving out, so I couldn't really cook, didn't really know how to shop carefully, I didn't really know what I should be buying every week and when. Kind of knew how to wash clothes, but not really. Didn't really have to budget up until that point. If you can do some practice or at least progress to, on any of these areas it will help you out a lot it's not i mean i i had very little knowledge going in and you sort of learn it as you go which is fine but it's more comfortable obviously if you can cook more than just pasta and pizzas one thing i wish i did which i didn't do but i think it would have helped me is visit the university before you move in so if it's not too far away go for a walk around the area see where your flat's going to be on campus see where the shops are go into some of the shops and drive them out, for example, just to get a bit more comfortable with the area. I think the issue is, I've put a game because you hopefully would have been for an open day, but the issue is the open days are so far ahead of you going, that it's often over a year between you going and visiting and actually moving in. And so it's a long time to forget what's there and feel uncomfortable, feel nervous. And so this might be helpful. Another tip from experience is it gets very, very, very busy in the first few days because everyone is moving into halls of residence. Ideally, buy the food and small things you need before you move in, or if you can't do that because it's going to go off or so on, go to a shop not nearby. The local Tesco's, the local Sainsbury's is going to be packed on those first few days. Try and be a little bit more strategic about where you get the stuff and when. The final few tips I want to give are when you're there, and I won't give too many because once you're there, you start to figure stuff out. But 
I think it's important to have in your head that the social side is more important than the academics, at least early on. I certainly did not really have that mindset. Some people obviously have that mindset, but I definitely didn't. I was very much right. I'm here to study. I'm going to socialise a little bit, but the studying is more important. Because the first year doesn't count in many cases, the social side is, is more important. But I would say go at your own pace. Don't feel pressured. You don't have to do more than you want. But equally, don't stay in your comfort zone too much. As I've kind of alluded to, I often skipped lectures and labs, unfortunately, but try to go to them. My experience of university was much, much better when I went, if I'm being realistic. I think I stopped going partly because others stopped going, and so you'd kind of see the lecture hall thinning out. This picture is of a very extreme example of, I think it was an optional lecture, which only two people went to, which is, like I say, extreme. But you would have, you'd go from a packed lecture theatre in the first week of term to maybe every other seat being left empty later on. Coincidentally, if there was a register taken, the lectures seem to be a lot more busy. I wonder why. But when you go, you will pick up more, especially the labs where you can ask questions. If you can get to know the lecturers, especially as they go towards the final year where they're more influential and more esteemed often, it's, it's good and you'll get more out of it. One thing which is important and I wasn't always great at is trying to get out and about even when you've got time off, even when you've got breaks, even when you're busy. In particular, when the course that was due, when I had exams coming up, I'd very much lock myself in my room, literally sometimes, and just study or just work. And it wasn't great for my well-being. So if you can go to the gym, if you can go to the shops, if you can go for a walk or go and work in the library, I think that's so much better than just being stuck inside all the time. Especially in computer science, where a lot of it is fixing errors in code, that can be very stressful and very mentally draining. Often, if you take a break and do something different, that distraction is enough for you to figure it out and fix whatever was causing the trouble. One thing which was true for me, which may be true for you, is first year might be harder than you expect. You might be throwing lots of content early on, which actually was harder than you realise. It wasn't a very gentle start, I've got to say, but it will get easier once you get more used to it. Don't get put off if people drop out, which always happens. Try and stick around if you can and if you have done A-level, if you have done GCSE, please don't get too demoralised if it's you know the same-ish content but feels a lot harder. That's sort of the point and like I say, it does definitely get easier over time. Me saying it might get easier maybe sounds kind of the opposite to what should happen because it should get harder as you go through the years but I think just you getting familiar with how things work, getting into better habits hopefully and the content builds on previous knowledge and so when it's all brand new to you or pretty much brand new to you you've not got much to build on but as you progress to your second and third years you are building on previous content you know that really tough maths module you might do in your first year maybe only a few bits and pieces get used in the second and final year and so it's not as hard as it might seem at the time that's what i'm trying to say okay so the content may get harder in theory but the experience i found got easier and finally, look after yourself. It is challenging, especially early on. Try and keep your support networks where you can. So speak to family, speak to friends, and look out for other people. Some people, you know, are very good at hiding how they're feeling, but other people in your flat, in your course, will be stressed at times, will be unhappy at times. Try and look out for them as well as yourself. Because ultimately there will be low points, but there are loads of high points as well. And as a kind of character building experience, as a knowledge building experience, university was great for me and I'm sure it would be really great if you go, if you end up there. So if you are applying to university or about to go, hopefully it all goes really well, I'm sure it will, and I wish you the best of luck.